All right. Hi, folks. So um, my name is John McClintock. I'm on the Amazon's information security team. Uh, my background is actually is, is in embedded software and, and development for mobile devices. But for the past 10 years or so, I've been doing application security professionally. Uh, first at Amazon, then as a consultant doing penetration testing at a boutique security consulting firm, and then back at Amazon for the past five years where I've been focused on building Amazon's application security program. So I'm not here to sell you on anything, although there's lots of stuff you can buy from us if you want. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about is the, the, the challenges and the approaches we found that, are, that work to make application security work at a company of Amazon's size. So Amazon was founded back in 1994, the early days of the internet, back when it was sufficient to have a firewall and use that new thing called SSL to uh, protect your customers. And initially we just sold books, and then we added CDs and DVDs and, and um, video. We branched out into electronics and apparel, and eventually had about 80 different categories of products we were selling. And we'd ship those all to your door in a nice little box with a smile on it. At the same time, we branched out into other lines of business. We started selling devices. So instead of running software on websites connected to the internet, we were now shipping hardware and running software on the hardware as well. We were selling digital content, so we weren't just putting stuff in boxes anymore. We were selling online things um, with, with, that were easily replicated and easily copied. And we also branched out, started selling our platform and selling the platform technologies we use as our web services products. So today, Amazon has grown. We're, we're based in Seattle, but we're a global company. We've got over 230 offices in 29 countries. And Really what we are is we're a global company that's fueled by innovation. We have all these different businesses, all based around technology and innovating in that technology space. And we literally have thousands and thousands of software developers that come in every day and do nothing but write more code. And you can pretty much buy anything you want on Amazon. People call us the anything store. You can go and see that we've got 17 packs of screws that you can get ordered tomorrow if you pay $4. And you can, you can get as many of them as you like, and you get them at that in, in 24 hours. And so if you think about what goes into that, um, it's actually a lot of different technologies. If you, if you just want to build an e-commerce site that just sells things, it's generally fairly straightforward. But if you want to build an e-commerce site that can sell 300 things every second, it becomes a lot more complicated. And so, you start to, Amazon is a very service-oriented company. We, we're very big on service-oriented architecture. And so what you see here is a map that we built. That circle up at the top there is the front-end retail website. And all the red lines going from, from that retail website circle are all the different services that the website calls in order to fulfill browsing and ordering and all those actions. And if you think about it, you've got to have services to manage inventory, services to take orders, services to process payments services to figure out where in the warehouse that screw that you ordered is and to tell a person to go pick it up and put it in a box and print a label and print that and, and send that off to you with a happy customer. And every single one of those services can impact the customer. They can impact the customer experience in a poor way or they can impact the customer experience in a positive way. And for Amazon, trust is really important. Uh, we're ranked as one of the most trusted companies in the world by a lot of different places. Um, both online and in retail and in cloud computing. And when you look into it, trust is about confidence. Trust is about making sure you get what we promise. If you say, I want it in two days, trust is us getting it to you in those two days. But it's also about protecting all the data that you're giving us. When you make an order with Amazon, you're giving us a lot of sensitive information. You're giving us your payment instruments. You're giving us your identity information. You're giving us, if you're using our cloud computing process, products, you're giving us pieces of your infrastructure that you want us to trust and protect. And so trust is about protecting that data and doing it consistently again and again and again. So when you look at how you secure software, traditionally what you get is the SDLC. It's very prescriptive. There's a lot of different steps that are involved in building secure software. Um, things from doing architecture and threat modeling and penetration testing and code audits and all these different steps that go pretty well in lockstep with a development process. Uh, but when you look at it, it's kind of an eye chart. Uh, and, and if you try and think about how you apply this 
in a large company, you quickly run into some big issues. First off, it doesn't scale. We found that applying the traditional SDLC takes about a month of one of our engineers' times, plus time on the, on the development team's side to, to do the other half of that effort. So what do you do if you've got 10,000 applications? Even if I had 100 people, 100 security engineers on my team, it would take eight man years for them to review all of those applications. And once you did review those, because Amazon is such a, an innovative and agile company, all that investment that you spent securing all those applications would quickly get thrown out the door because what you reviewed now is going to quickly morph into something very different a year or even a few months down the line. And so at Amazon, innovation is our lifeblood. We are, we, are we are a technical company. We happen to do retail, we happen to do cloud computing, we happen to sell devices. But by and large, we are a technical company. We're a software company. And we are a very open company. So teams within Amazon have a lot of latitude to do whatever they want. They, they can choose whatever development methodology they prefer. Some teams use waterfalls, some teams use Scrum. Some teams just build software and ship it when they feel like it's ready. Uh, and they have a lot of freedom to use the different technologies that they want. Uh, we have a lot of use of open source technologies. But teams can use whatever technologies they want in order to, to provide the best customer experience. And in some cases, you get really exotic technologies like Scala or, or really exotic caching technologies or things like that that you wouldn't think of work in a large scale company like Amazon, but they happen to solve that one problem that that one team is owning very almost perfectly. And so we can't block the company. We can't, as a centralized security organization, we can't stop them from innovating. We can't put up walls or gates that prevent them from doing the things they're doing that make us uh, such a very strong company. And so when I came back to Amazon and I started working on application security, I, I realized there were a couple of different things I needed to do. First, I needed to harness a lot of the cultural norms that, that make Amazon powerful. And I needed to recognize and embrace them. Second, I needed to gather a lot of data. I needed to gather data that can help the business and can help us do our work. And I needed to automate all of that process. I needed to automate as much as possible so that there wasn't the human scaling element. Instead, I was just scaling systems and processes. So Amazon's a very peculiar company. We've got a lot of different cultural uh, values and norms. Um, but I'm sure that this applies pretty well across any, uh, any organization, which is that you've got cultural values and cultural principles that you can leverage that align directly with the security organization's goal. For example, one of our primary leadership principles is customer obsession. Leaders at Amazon, which includes our engineers, our, our developers, work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. And having that as a leadership principle that's shared by everyone across Amazon is really valuable for me in a security world because I can tie security directly to an impact to customer trust. Ownership is another strong value within Amazon. Everyone within Amazon is considered to be an owner. We give teams, we give development teams, a lot of latitude in terms of technologies and processes, but they're responsible for owning the impact of those decisions. If their service breaks, they, they're the ones that get paged, and they're the ones that have to operationally support it. And so owners think not just um, uh, about what their team owns, but they also think about impact to the broader company and impact to the customers. And finally, we have it codified as a leadership principle that we have really high standards and we deliver high quality products. And we make sure that when we fix things, they stay fixed. So these three values, customer obsession, ownership, and high standards, all really relate directly to a security organization's goal, goals and uh, responsibilities. Plus, Amazon has a really strong culture about making decisions based off data. If you go and make a subjective case that uh, we need to do X or Y because it has a, a quantifiable benefit, then you're much more likely to, uh, to, to gain, a, gain traction than if you uh, come with opinions and uh, say, this must be done because the industry is doing it, or this must be done because I feel it's right. You have to bring data to the table to, to drive decisions within Amazon. And so based off those cultural values and that data-driven data approach, we built a strategy for scaling application security. 
first step was to build a map of our universe, build a map of the computing environment within Amazon. Highly decentralized, lots of services, lots of independence within the service teams. And so we use that map to enable self-service, allow, allow the service owners to own their own security, which gives us the ability to focus our, our limited resources on the high value targets, the applications that are most important. And finally, automate validation, automate validation that people are applying a baseline level of security, and automate validation that people are following the processes and procedures on their own time. So we set out to build a map, and the first thing we had to do was figure out what we were mapping. We had to define what an application is. And in Amazon's environment, that's really challenging because you've got software that is running a traditional web stack. You've got software that's running back-end applications. You've got software that's shipping on devices, and software that customers install on their own devices. And so we defined an application really broadly. An application is zero or more source code packages, software deployments, hosts, SSL certificates, things like that. All of the artifacts that could be part of the software we define as an application. And so an application is really just a container for any of those things. And you can even have an empty application that doesn't have any of them uh, that represents something that a team wants to go build, that they want to start doing security work on before they have it fully defined. So next we define what's important, what makes an application important. And again, with the customer focus, customer data is really important. And having a classification scheme for your data, having a data classification policy and a catalog of what data meets what classification is really vital here. We define customer data and we define which kinds of customer data are important. Obviously credit cards, uh, but also customer identity information, their addresses and email addresses, and their order and browse history. If you're buying things on the website, you're trusting us to protect that history and keep it private. Additionally, access control systems and authentication systems and some of your high business impact systems like your code uh, deployment systems. All of those are, are important applications. And so we mapped, we mapped the application concept and we mapped what, what, it, what is sensitive to us and what's important to us and built a classification system. It's a four-step classification system. You've got green applications, which are your experiments, your internal or your development services. You've got yellow applications that are your back-end low-risk services that, that, are, that aren't handling sensitive data. You've got orange applications where you actually start to see data exposure and risk. These are external applications that aren't handling much inf sensitive information or they're handling low volumes of, of sensitive information. And then finally, you've got your red applications, and these are your important ones. These are the ones that, that you really need to invest in and make your effort to protect. These are the ones that are handling bulk customer data and that are implementing access control, access control mechanisms and so forth. So we've defined an application, we've defined what makes an application important, and we've defined a classification system for those applications. And so it's time to start gathering data. You pull in data from your source code repositories, your build and deployment systems, your asset management and your inventory systems. You collect that data and then you assign it to the applications that, the, that those components belong to. And then you classify those applications. So you've got your red application, your orange application, your green application. And wherever possible, you want to automate this process. Um, in our initial efforts, we just basically went out to all the application owners, all the engineers, and said, here's everything, tell us where it goes. And that wasn't very successful, just because they're busy, they see this as scut work that they don't want to be doing, and they don't see the value, because they know that they're going to quickly develop more software that, gets out of, that makes this out of date. And so wherever possible, automate. If you see someone doing a deployment with a new package, ask the developer, hey, is this new package part of this application? So you're having the developers contribute by refining your model and not defining the model and providing the baseline data. So you've got a map. Um, and it's actually pretty useful to have a map because now you can see where your enterprise risk is, where it's not, which parts of your business have a lot of risk and which parts of your business um, you, can, you can leave alone. What do you do with that map? If you've heard of the Pareto Principle, where 20% of your effort is what produces 80% of your results, you can use that map to fight that. Because that 80% of your effort that's only producing 20% of your results, you want to eliminate that as much as possible. And having that map let, that lets you know where you should be investing and where you shouldn't be investing helps you fight that and make the bulk of your investment produce much, much higher quality results. 
And so we applied that to our map. If you've got a green application, we're not going to force you to do a review. We're not going to force you to do any security work to, to validate your experiment is working or that your development application is working. <coughs> if you've got a yellow application, we're going to tell you to do a lightweight self-service review to establish a baseline of security. And if you've got an orange application, we're going to require you to do an in-depth review on your own. And that includes all the classic as aspects of the SDLC, things like threat modeling, things like code, code assessment, code review, and uh, penetration testing, all of that stuff, to establish a baseline level of security for that application. And then it's the red applications that we focus our efforts on, and where we invest our security engineers to make sure that they're secure, because these applications have the highest risk to our customers. And so you take the results of these review processes from the self-service reviews down to your deep dive red application reviews, you take all the results and work product of those efforts and you put that back in your map. So you've got a documentation on the system's architecture. You've got a documented threat model. You've documented what code was reviewed and what penetration tests were performed, as well as all the risks that were identified. You could just put this in Word documents and put them on a SharePoint somewhere, um, but having them in your map and in your systems for automated analysis provides you a lot of benefits. You can see who's got what risks and who's doing a good job of performing these review tasks. You can go after the fact and automatically see who's doing the right level of depth and who's doing the right level of testing for their applications. So you've mapped your environment, you've colored in the map, and you've got application owners reviewing the less important applications on their own, and your team, your security experts, are focusing on the most important ones. Let's dive into that self-service bit a little bit more. Um, when, you, when you let a team do a self-service review, when you let them fully own the security of their product, you're trusting them to do the right thing. You're trusting that they're going to actually do the work and not just check the boxes. And you're trusting that they understand what needs to be done and what the security requirements are. And so the way you achieve that trust is with a combination of training, <coughs> tools, and auditing. And we actually built a, a training program that we're pretty proud of. It's called the Security Certifiers Program. And what we do is we take engineers, uh, SDEs, QA engineers, uh, SDE testers, we take these engineers who know how to use code and we enroll them in this program and we give them training, lots and lots of training. We have instructor and computer-led training. Uh, we have about 22, 24 hours of, of computer-based training that these engineers can take, ranging from secure development practices to uh, platform-specific uh, issues to how to do code assessments, how to do threat modeling, how to uh, do penetration testing. And then we give them guns. We give them evaluation guides for these common technologies. If you've got a, we've got a lot of people that build on Apache. So we produce guides on how to securely, uh, how to secure an Apache installation. Uh, give them tools for doing threat modeling, for doing static analysis of code bases, and for doing penetration testing. And we show them how to use these tools so they can get a baseline level of security before we dive in to the, to the important applications. And finally, you have to give these people authority. You have to give them the authority to make decisions, make risk decisions on their own. If, you, if they have to come to you every time they have to make a risk decision, then you've lost that scaling. You've lost that ability to let them work independently. Uh, and so you make a framework for them to, to make risk decisions. Below this level, they can make the call. Above this level, they have to engage your centralized security organization and get the right level of sign-off. But again, you have to make them earn it. Make them take the training. Make them take tests so they can demonstrate that they have the skills and, and knowledge. Make them do reviews under mentorship so that they can really get the hands-on experience and demonstrate that they know what they need to do. And finally, cultivate community. Uh, we have branding. We've, we've done a lot of work to brand this, this, uh, this program and give it an image that, that people look up to. We create mailing lists and forums for these engineers to communicate about their experiences in reviewing applications. We have meetups and internal conferences where we invite external speakers to talk about the latest industry events with, with regards to security. And never underestimate the value of swag, hoodies and, and lanyards and things like that, as well as recognition through things like phone tool icons and stuff like that. So again, trust these guys to do the right thing, but verify their work. Don't let it turn into the wild, wild west. Give them mentors, give them hands-on guidance. Implement automated bump bumper rails so that they're not just checking boxes. And then perform manual spot checks, audit their work once or twice a year to make sure that they're producing high quality results. 
So we saw a lot of benefits from running the program this way. It gives us a lot more people in the field, which gives application owners a lot quicker response time if they need to get a review done. And they act as a huge force multiplier. One of my security engineers who's doing one review a month can do 12 reviews in a year. But if he's mentoring a dozen or a couple dozen um, security certifiers who are each doing four reviews a year, then all of a sudden he's got a 10x increase in his productivity and the scope of applications he can cover. Plus it gives these, participating in this program, gives these engineers career development and, and career path opportunities. Uh, it gives them exposure to new technologies and new processes and new, uh, new, uh, new teams and it lets them get exposure outside of their team to see what's, what's going on in the broader Amazon. So you've got this amazing program. How do you get people to actually use it? If you apply the top-down approach, uh, you're going to talk to the CEO, and no CEO is going to tell you that security is not important, especially not the CEO of a company that has customer obsession as a core leadership principle. So he's going to say it's important, and he's going to go to his senior vice president and say, security is important, go do security. And his senior vice president is going to say, okay, we're going to go do security. And then they're going to go back to delivering on their goals and their commitments. Likewise, if you start from the bottom up, working from the engineers, the engineers get it too. They understand that security is important. But hearing that security is important isn't enough. It doesn't help them when their manager says, okay, you've got this deliverable on this schedule, go do that. So how do you drive adoption? Well, this is where your, your cultural norms come into play again. What you want to do is target that fat middle, the, the, the layers between your senior vice presidents and your engineers, and get them to really care about security and drive their organizations to own security. So you've got data, let's go use it. Give them a dashboard. Give, give your managers dashboards, give your organizations dashboards to tell them where they are now and where they want to be and where you want them to be. And give them fine-grained metrics. Don't just give them an overall score. Give them scores for each of the different facets of security. How well they're doing at owning their own security. How well they're doing at training on security and mitigating risks. Perhaps one organization does really good at running through the reviews, but then they just sit on a huge pile of issues and risks that they found. Give them metrics that, that let them know where specifically you want them to be doing work. And give them drill down so the CEO can go and look for each of his organizations. Where is security strong and where is security weak? And, that can, and one of the most effective ways to get people to take action is to give a senior vice president a dashboard that says that some of his vice presidents aren't doing so well. And he'll quickly yell at those vice presidents who will cascade it down the chain and get the work done to make sure that our customers are protected. Now, fundamentally, this is culture change. This isn't new technology, this isn't new processes. This is about adapting security processes to the culture of an organization. Um, you will have to refine your approach as you're going through these same processes in your own organizations. The key thing here is to listen to your customers and figure out what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And continually raise the bar. Establish a bar and get people to meet that bar. Most companies work on an annual planning process. So if your company's down here and you want them up there and it's going to take you three years to get there, they're going to ignore you because that doesn't fit into their annual planning process. Instead, if they're here, set a bar that they can reach within a year and the next year raise that bar and continually raise that bar so that over time you get to where you want to be. So just to recap, the approach that I found works, that works really successfully at Amazon is to identify the cultural norms that, that really relate to security and play off those norms to gather data about how your organization is doing. Use that data to allow you, the security experts, to focus your limited resources on the important things and then build programs to harness your engineers and scale your processes. Again, use that data to drive adoption and trust people to do the right thing and verify it through auditing. You'll never get 100% adoption, or you'll never get 100% security even. But knowing that you're at 90% is far better than thinking you're at 100% when you're actually at 10%. Any questions? All right. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Pen 
Right. So the question is, what are we using to do security testing of our existing applications? Uh, we have a number of different tools that we use, uh, both commercial and, and, and home-built. Home um, things like uh, Burp Suite and, and AppScan, things like that. Um, where we've done a lot of work is integrating those tools in with our application security tools and our, and our data gathering processes so that they feed their findings into those processes. And so that we can say, run a Burp Suite scan using automated tools and feed the results into our risk management systems. And you use a, an actual plan and then as the projects go along, you continue to do all Yes, Make so the question is, do you, do you do an annual plan and then as projects go along, um, do it? Yes, the, the, the baseline requirement is an annual security review. Um, but then what we encourage teams to do is automate all the different processes around doing the security testing and quality aspects so that they get a continuous baseline of, of what's changed and what's, what's secure and what issues are being created. All right, thank you very much.